The Creatives with AI podcast. The spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Lena, welcome back. Hi. Good to be back. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit of a different episode today. Um, for everybody out there, obviously last week or week before last, I put out an episode talking about how you know, that the podcast was going to change and that we were getting in line with some of the other shows on with AI FM. And one of the things that we're going to do is I'm going to hand over uh, hosting uh, responsibilities to Lena moving forward for the creative show. So Lena, thank you very much for stepping up to do that. Yeah, more than welcome. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm excited to have you. I think it's going to be great. And for maybe for people who didn't listen to the last episode, the reason that I really am excited for Lena to do it is, is for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it's got huge personality and I think will be really interesting to have as someone to host the conversation. It's probably more interesting than me. <laughs> I think that you also have a your background of working with creatives and also working with creative agencies over the last, I don't know how many, couple of decades, I guess, something. gives you a, a much more creative, you're an actual creative, whereas I'm kind of a fake creative. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's going to help make the discussions a little bit better as we move forward. Because I think originally the show, I very much wanted to be in the beginning, the canary in the coal mine that, was raising the flag to say, hey, I think this is going to be an issue and we should all think about this and, you know, AI might be a problem. I think over the last year, what's happened is it's calmed down a little bit. Mm. And I think what's really interesting is that a lot of creative people are figuring out how to use AI in a productive and a positive way. And yeah, there's still some issues that we need to talk about, but I'm not so much worried about the and, and maybe that's wrong, but I'm not so much worried about being the canary in the coal mine. I now think the conversation needs to move on to how are people actually really, how are people using it and how are they being creative with it and that sort of thing. And I know that you in your personal network have loads of interesting people to talk to and to talk about that and artists who are using AI and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be quiet for a minute and let you talk, but if maybe you could just give a little bit of your background sure. sort of, you know, for the people who didn't listen to your episode and people can always go back and listen to that if they want as well. Of course, please do. And all the other ones, but yeah, just introduce yourself, tell everybody where you came from a little bit about maybe what you're thinking about with the show and we'll just sure. see where it goes. Thank you very much. Uh, great introduction. Um, I was really excited when I listened to your podcast uh, last week that was generally talking about what you're going to be doing with, um, the group of podcasts that you've got and I immediately thought oh I really want to talk to him about whether I could be one of the one of the hosts anyway as it turns out you'd already thought about it and you said would you like to do uh, creatives with AI and having already been a host I, I was sort of familiar with it um, what I'm really excited about is that you and I are old enough to have gone through several things in the world i.e the introduction of the internet uh way back in the day and everybody freaked out about that and was like oh our jobs are gonna you know there's so many things that in social media like anything new that comes in you look through history and i'm a big history but if you look at through history and the anthropology the 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 changing of civilization and there's always big massive things you know, the Industrial Re Revolution, et cetera, et cetera, where everybody freak, well, a lot of people freak out, but those that are smart enough um, adjust to what needs to be do. They learn about it, they adjust to it, and they utilise it the way that it, it was, I guess, probably originally meant to do, which is to enhance and, and, and what have you. Um, there are still plenty of artists and creatives out there that are worried about it but I also think there's a need for more education around it so that that fear drops you know it's just you know I've got a background uh, with my my peer, my dad did his degree in art history and anthropology hence why I'm interested in those topics always was around artists and creatives you know quite bohemian 
and when I talk about artists, I'm talking about musicians and painters and sculptors and, you know, uh, filmmakers and comedians and, you know, creativity comes in lots of different th ways and means. And, you know, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute about where I want to take the podcast generally. Um, but from there, I ended up doing lots of different jobs, but ended up in the creative industry. I took uh, myself, I did uh, art design, uh, technical drawing and photography at school. So I am an artist myself, but I'm not necessarily saying I'm the best artist, but I love creating and I love crafting and, and that kind of thing. So from that perspective, I have an empathy for where artists are coming from. But I ended up in the commercial world of creativity, which is advertising and marketing agencies across all the different spectrums, like brand creativity, making advertising, but also the, the marketing world of like, you know, everything from like a sticker to a shelf wobbler to whatever. So I understand from that perspective as well that there is many types of creatives in that world. So I've got a, a, a broad view of what I think creativity is, which includes thinking, by the way, creative thinking for me is as creative as somebody that can draw or can you know build a sculpture yeah. out of you know mud yeah. bricks or whatever creativity is broad and i don't think it's good to just narrow it down to a couple of areas but in saying no that, you're absolutely right on that sorry yeah. to just to jump in but you're absolutely right on that and i think a lot of people you know I, throughout the podcast up until now i've been i've spoken to a lot of people in industries that maybe people wouldn't traditionally think of as creative. I think a lot of times when you say creative, people just think of artists, painters, illustrators, maybe musicians, that sort of thing. They don't think about software engineers or entrepreneurs or anything, you know, you can have you can have creative people. I mean, the legal field is quite creative in some ways. Yes, it's very rigid and very limited in a lot of ways, but it's also you know, there are lawyers out there who are always pushing the boundaries. They're coming up. They're very creative in their interpretation of the law and how it works. And, yeah. you know, medicine has to be very creative as well because you, I mean, a surgeon has to be massively creative. They have to be able to think on the fly. That's creativity, really, because yep. you get into a body and sometimes the organs aren't where they're supposed no, to be, all the which is, to me is to totally or... bizarre. Like, yeah, I mean, I've talked to surgeons and they're like, literally, you, you know, you can open up someone and stuff is supposed to be generally in the same place but sometimes it's flipped around or it's on the back of their body and yep. it's like you know you you never really know until you get in there what it's going to be like so yeah i totally agree with you i think you know creativity is something that you do it's not it's something that you bring to whatever it is that you do it's not necessarily a job yeah agreed and i think that actually although we've got a very specific theme about creatives with ai Actually, in my mind, it, although we'll still stick to that theme, there is a there is a broad spectrum of people that my brain already, like off the back of you and I catching up a person yesterday and talking about what could possibly be included, like the mere fact that you've just talked about law. Like if you just think like that, law and AI is definitely going to be something that's going to be impacted, right? So there could be lawyers for musicians. There could be lawyers for... Um, uh, commercial artists and book illustrators. Like, there's a there's a lot of feel. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to try really hard not to have any boring people on. Um, but it's it's going to impact <laughs> lots of different areas in the world of business. And let's be honest, like truly honest. Although you and I ag agreed yesterday that neither of us are driven by money, we all have to earn a living. And one of the things that I'm I love having with my art gallery, the FTSQ Gallery. It's drivers to support artists that intend to leave behind a legacy, and that's pretty much most most artists. And in order to support that legacy, they need to earn money, right? So to pretend yeah. otherwise is yeah, silly, which is why the lawyers get involved in all the rest of it, and Tom, my artist, has got a, a very interesting view on that, which will be exciting because I think he's going to be my first uh, interview. Um yeah, it's it's an interesting. I think we've got lots to to discover and lots to talk about, and I think it's going to be an endless supply of yeah. people. I think. 
in lots of different areas. Yeah, so yeah, 100%. that's kind of where I want to head down. Musicians and cool. uh, film, video, uh, nor or artists, which inside itself has many different people. You know, there's design, there's architects. Yeah, it's endless. And I going back to something you said a minute ago about artists, you know, I think of, again, a lot of people look at classic art and things like that and like Da Vinci and all that. And, you know, you look at the Sistine Chapel and things like that. And that was commissioned work. An yep. artist didn't do that for fun. They were paid yep. by the Pope to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were making a living by creating art. And I think, you know, a lot of the the artists, the, the classic artists, and, you know, people look at it and I think they forget that this is what these people did for a living and they made money doing it. Yep. And it's no different. It was no different back then than it is. They didn't, I mean, yes, okay, you know, they had a skill and they, they used their skill, but it, it was a job. And so a lot of that art was done because someone paid them to do it. Mm. And we shouldn't lose sight of that. You're absolutely right. And no, I think that's really... one of the, the right. subtexts of the, of the podcast so far has kind of been for those people who, who are creatives in, with a capital C and, and do that as a business and a career. You know, AI is having an impact but it's not having the impact that maybe we initially thought. We thought it was just going to replace everybody, but I'm, we have some people in common that we know, and I think they're going to be on your show probably in the first couple of guests at least, mm. who it's it's increased their capacity to be able to create and to produce content for people in a professional setting. So they have clients who come to them and say, hey, I need to commission you to do you know, 200 images for a hotel chain or 200 images for whatever. And it's like, they need to go and produce that mm -hmm. and they can produce drafts very quickly. And I don't want to steal the story. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, I'll save that for later, yep. but you know, but, but it's, it's given them the ability to, to deliver more work in a shorter amount of time, but they're still doing the work and they're still, yep. you know, they're still using it to get to the point that they want to get to. And I think that's what's really interesting. And that's where I think, again, you and I talked about this yesterday, but it's where I think you want to now pick up that conversation yeah. and let's take it to the next stage. So yeah, I think that's really, really interesting. I think what's really interesting about that, and you know, I know who you're talking about with regards to the host hotel stuff, that's Tom. Um, I think what's interesting uh, about, and it is an education thing once again about AI is that, from the moment I came across and started talking to Tom, my fine artist, about it, Tom, Tom Morley, he was surprised that as a gallery I was interested in talking to him because I approached him. We've been friends for a few years on different things, but not didn't realise he, he had the art background. And when I found out and I approached him, he was quite surprised because he thought, he, he said most galleries are not looking at, the, at, at it the same way that I was, which is simply... AI is a tool. Um, I've seen him have conversations with other artists and his Facebook pages and things like that where the people have gone, oh, that's really amazing, but I worry about my art. And he said, and he, I know he does, he still creates art in multiple different ways. You know, some artists will do collage and some artists will do um, sculpture and some will do you know ceramics and like there's lots of different ways he he still sketches he still um uh paints and draws and 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 also uses the ai but he's using ai for he music he does ceramics and, as well doesn't he yep ceramics yeah it, what's interesting about that is that it starts with the concept like you can any tool you know you give a paintbrush to a chipmunk and they're going to do a crap job right you give a paintbrush to a an artist who understands where they're coming from, what their concept is, and they know where they're going. And I know some artists don't always start with a concept, they just kind of start. But whatever that is, that thing that innately makes them a creative a creative and an artist is not gonna change whether they're using AI or a paintbrush or a or a, a knife for sculpting or whatever, or a welding arc arc welder or whatever. You know, whatever those tools are, good is going to be good, bad is going to be bad. The tool doesn't matter. And that's kind of the way I look at AI, you know, and why I'm so excited to use this podcast to educate people, to take some of the fear away, to encourage those 
artists that are maybe not wanting to use it just carry on it's not like you're going to be taken over you know so yeah that's kind of what my thinking is on that nice and i also want to go back to a couple of things one you mentioned your podcast so this isn't your first rodeo by the way no um, so you have had your own podcast so Give a little plug to everybody to go listen. I know there's a few episodes there, and I've listened to a few of them while I was on the treadmill and really enjoyed really enjoyed the stuff that you've done in the past. And I think you've still got some more episodes that are recorded that we're going to get out for that as with. well. Yep. So let's, yeah, so let, you know, but um, um, talk a little bit about that. Sure. And then I want to follow up on something else as well. Sure. So the business, I've, I've got a couple of businesses going on, FTSQ Gallery, which we've just talked about, and they've got FTSQ, the, more the business consultancy. And the, the consultancy always, and hence why I ended up working in the art world as well, was always focused on working with non-conformists. They are my favourite type of people, the people that are square pegs and round holes, the kind of ones that, they're the ones that change the world, the people that push the boundaries, that do things differently. I mean, a, a perfect example of a non-conformist is Taika Waititi or Jeff Goldblum or Grace Jones or, you know, those people that kind of just push, do things differently, think differently, therefore their outcome is different. And so the podcast that I had for FTSQ General was about um, celebrating the non-conformists. So, you know, I've had, you know, I've, I've got a, a person on there that I interviewed who is a blind, uh, transgender um, uh, desi uh, clothing designer for fetish clothing. You cannot get more nonconformist than that. But just the journey. We talk about the journey, <laughs> right? It is. And it sounds totally random when you listen to it. You're just like. Uh, okay, actually, I have to listen to that because I don't understand how any of that fits together. But here's the. But when you listen to it and you find out that he used to be in the military, that he, you know, before he was um, doing what he's doing now with his uh, his partner Fifi, they were he was um, loved cars, so he could pull any car apart, put it back together, re-engineer it, like really amazing. Has done some pretty amazing stuff in in the world of, like I said, the military, like, and we're not just talking he was infantry, he was doing quite specialist work from what I understand. Um, can't talk about it, obviously. Uh, but what was what's interesting about that is I love the backstories. The same with my artists. I like telling those backstories and finding out like what drives them and where what motivates them and where it comes from. So that's kind of what that's about. It kind of got dropped for a wee while, for quite a few years, while I was dealing with some um, physical illness that I was dealing with. Now that that has, is being dealt with and I'm moving back into working and what have you and getting involved with you, I will be continuing to record for that as well. And they kind of sit nicely beside each other, I think, for me. Because both are about doing things differently. Yeah, 100%. So that's what that's And what about. does FTSQ stand for? Uh, <laughs> FTSQ, which will not surprise you when you understand that I was wanting to attract and talk to and work with nonconformists. FTSQ stands for fuck the status quo. Because quite frankly, sometimes the status quo is a bit shit. So that's what that's about. That's about challenging things and being okay to challenge. But if it's okay, leave it as it is, but move it and change it and take action if it's not. So that's what that's about. 100%. Totally agree. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was you talked a little bit about your background, but maybe because obviously you have an accent and for <laughs> people who haven't listened to the other show, True. you're from New Zealand. I am. But maybe talk a little bit about your background from New Zealand and what that was like. And I know you mentioned that you had artists and stuff around, but you do have a very, I think you've got a very interesting perspective on things because of the background that you have and if you don't mind sharing sure i think it'd be interesting for people just to get a little bit more of a of a picture of who you are sure so as you can tell the kiwi accent comes out even after 21 years living in london it's still very strong um and i am very much a kiwi at my heart it is my i love england and i probably won't necessarily go back to live in new zealand ever or if i do it'll be a long way away um but New Zealand, here's why it's different, I think. 
and why my background is the way it is and why, I, you know, I am who I am. Um, I was brought up by a um, a mother who is uh, half Māori, which is the Indigenous people of New Zealand, and half Scottish. So that's her side of the family. So that brings with it a whole lot of interesting cultural things, tribal things, history, background that is quite unique. Um, as you can tell, I, I do present as white, so that has its own interesting internal arguments, yep. discussions, things that I have, what have you. Um, my father is, as you can tell, having have, with him having done his um, Bachelor of Arts in Art History and Anthropology, he's an amazing thinker, a really smart man. Um, both my parents are my heroes. Uh, in the fact that they have run their own businesses. Um, they've owned plant nurseries, so I gr grew up propagating plants and weeding things and growing things, so that's one part of who I am. But also uh, both my parents ran their very successful landscaping business, which several times they lost several of their businesses for different reasons, none of them their fault, by the way. So one of them was a recession recession in the 80s the other one was a, a big big massive client literally um, booking them and then leaving the country and leaving them completely unpaid that was horrendous but I've learned a lot of things watching what they've done well and what they haven't done so well but what's always inspired me with them is that they never grew uh, never gave up on anything they are as positive as you can imagine about supporting me and what I'm doing and my brother's won't surprise you that all three of us all own our own businesses. My brother, two younger brothers and myself, very entrepreneurial. The one thing that I think is also different about being brought up in, New, I was brought up in rural New Zealand as well. So um, the thing when you get asked around the table, what's that one thing that people will be surprised about you? And, that you know, you're sitting in a boardroom and whatever, and I'm dressed up to the nines and look like I'm the new business person, usually. Uh is that I can milk a cow by hand and everybody goes, well, but that's, you know, that, that <laughs> mixture Love of it. that, the rural upbringing, the freedom of the 80s, you know, kid freedom in the 80s in rural New Zealand, you can run around at nine o'clock at night in the paddocks and nobody cared, you know. Um, but because my parents are also different in their belief systems, my mother is still a, a active Jehovah's Witness, uh, and very religious, um, but but also reasonable with it. Although she's very strong in her belief, she's very kind and thoughtful and understanding of the fact that I have chosen to leave that religion, um, but she still loves me and cares for me and is exactly the same mum as she always has been. My dad is agnostic. Well, that's good. Yeah, very good. I'm very lucky. Um, uh, my dad is agnostic, so... I've had I've had two different, very different views of the way of living, which is why I think I'm so open to multiple lifestyles. You know, I'm not freaked out by lifestyles, despite the fact that my mum is quite religious. We would have a lot of people coming through the house that were very creative, very bohemian and hippie-ish like, um, that, as I said, were painters and creators and you know, some pretty wild characters, which I love the fact. And it's probably, I get that love of the nonconformist from my dad, but I know my mum is quite nonconformist in her own right. You know, she's very creative. She was originally a florist by trade and still does it here and there for free for people. Um, very okay. creative yeah. from that perspective. Smart as anything, kicks my butt when it comes to scrabble and things, any word things, she kicks my backside. Um, smart woman. Very, yeah, So, but I, in New Zealand also we've been really lucky culturally that um, women, like uh, New Zealand women uh, were the first in the world to get the vote by quite a bit. I think at least a year for the world and compared to the UK it was like seven years difference. We've had, you know, three female prime ministers. At one point both the prime minister and the leader of the opposition were female, and I've been brought up not, and I think this is quite specific to my parents as well, I've been brought, both of my brothers and I have been brought up thinking about us as humans rather than gender, and it's not that our gender doesn't matter, of course it does, and it differentiates us, but at the same time, I 
walk through the world not worrying about whether I'm going to be accepted because I'm a woman or I'm not. I walk into a boardroom, and I've had interesting discussions with women about this. I walk into a boardroom not even thinking that I'm not going to get listened to. I automatically know I will be. Now, that's a weird thing for most women, and it's unusual. But I think it's because my bro my brothers and I were brought up literally being treated the same. They've been taught to cook and clean and all those kinds of things, as have I. But I've also been taught how to build and tile a floor and you know i remember as a pre-teen i and yep. it's still there i've gone back on google earth and i've gone back to our family home in the south island of new zealand which is away from where my parents live now and i can still see the brick path that i laid as a pre-teen so because of that i guess i look at the world a little bit slightly differently so that kind of in a nutshell is me um no bullshit, straight talking, get to the point. But I give a shit about things. I care about things very deeply. Um, to my own detriment sometimes, often putting others before myself. Uh, working with my therapist on that to make sure I'm coming first too. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's important. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That that's where I come yeah. from, which is why doing well for my artists and helping them and working with creatives and encouraging whatever format the creativity and art comes in is so vitally important to me yeah and that was the reason so there was a reason that i wanted to dig into that story a little bit and i think it i think we share something in common in that because we were both brought up in rural areas i was brought up on a you know we had 300 acres of farmland outside of memphis and you know i, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents when i was younger and you know in that in that rural farmer type community, a couple of things stand out. Number one, there's no bullshit. <laughs> like everybody's pretty straight talking. Yep. There's no politics. There's no anything. Everybody just, everybody talks plainly. Mm. It's not that people aren't intelligent. It's just that they speak plainly because I think in a lot of those environments and doing a lot of that type of work, you have to be very direct and very clear or else people are going to get injured, yeah. especially around farm equipment yeah. or animals, animals or anything like yeah. that. You have to, you're right. You, you know, when you start dealing with cattle and, and, and horses and all that sort of stuff, you have to learn how to do that. And you have, it needs to be simple instructions that you talk to people. So yeah. I think we learned to be very plain and, and straightforward speaking from those types of environments. And I also think oh, that, sorry. and it's it's brilliant that you that you went there in your story. I also think that in rural communities, in a funny kind of way, on one hand, you have very traditional gendered roles in that, you know, a lot of times the women take care of the house and the men go out and do the mm. farming and they do all the work. But that's only part of the story because yeah. on a farm, everybody does everything. Yeah. Like you just, everybody has to do stuff. If you're, if you're farming and you're, and you're growing soybeans or you're growing wheat or you're growing something like that, when it's harvest time, everybody's working on the harvest. That's it. Like everybody does it. If you grow bell, when I grew up in middle Tennessee, they used to grow lots of um, green bell peppers. Oh, and and when it was harvest season, like all the kids didn't go to school. The wives were out in the field. The kids were out in the field, no matter what age they were. Like everybody was picking bushels and bushels and bushels and bushels. And oh my God, it just like, that's all everybody did. And it was there, there was an whilst there were window, still right? those traditional gender roles, but they were they were there was also this total and complete equality across everything. Every, you know, men knew how to do everything, women knew how to do everything, and you just had to do it. Uh, it's exactly and the same. I as think how that's I... a that's oh. something I don't see in cities yeah. so much is because you don't need it. And then I think what you get in urban areas is you get more of a distinction because. You don't have to, you don't have to be that way. So you end up with these more defined roles. And anyway, it's brilliant that you went there because it was kind of what I was getting at. And it, and it does help explain sort of, I think anyway, kind of why you are the way you are and, you know, kind of the background that brings you there. That was all. I agree. It's really interesting hearing you talking about that because I hadn't really thought about it like that before, but you're absolutely right. I think what is also, so yes, I think the fact that everybody just rolls their sleeves up and gets done, you know, when it's harvest time, you have a window of time in which to do everything and everybody just piles in kids, you know, wives, yeah. girlfriends, yeah. husbands, boyfriends, whatever that thing, you know, everybody's just, you know, rolling up their sleeves. What also hit me though, well, when you were talking about that 
and I hadn't really thought about this before, but farmers are essentially entrepreneurs. You know, they're small business owners. They have to be because they are growing things. They they have, although they, you know, yeah. you chuck them into a boardroom, they'd be like possibly like deer in a headlights, but they are hustling. They are growing things, building relationships, which is massively, for me, I think, an art that is getting lost, that ability to build a proper, strong, solid, long-term relationship. Um, I mean, my parents are still yeah. friends with all the people they did work with, both cl- not all the clients, but some of the clients are still friends with years after they've sold their business and retired, but also all the suppliers, like the tile suppliers and the engineers and bricklayers and, you know, all sorts of people. That is rare, and it's something that I've learned from them, watching them how they do business or did business. Like for me, is that relationship thing's really important. But the other thing that that hit me was, yeah, like I said, that that entrepreneurial spirit, but mind and thinking, and have like they have to deal with so many things, like weather, seasons. Stuff goes wrong all the time. You know, you get pests coming in and wipe out an entire crop. I've se- I've seen yep. over the years a few. I mean, of any industry that's had to pivot, it's been that massively hit by the industrial revolution. It's definitely been hit by global changes with you know pests literally being able to fl- get into other countries on the back of people, on the back of luggage, all that kind of thing. You've also had they've also had to deal with, you know, global warming, and I've watched some t- interesting things on Discovery Plus and things like that. Like there's these farmers in America who've turned to rather than farming their properties, they're now digging up dinosaur bones and selling them. Or you'll get people that are moving into <laughs> yeah. hydroponics, yeah. or you'll get. Like one thing I really love watching, which is hilarious, but talk about entrepreneurial is the moonshiners, right? The moonshiners in America who are making moonshine, again, entrepreneurial as hell they've had to be because they had to run away from the law and all the rest of it. What's interesting is the show is watching them starting to turn into to making them into profitable uh, yeah. uh, commercial businesses. businesses. Yeah. These guys are okay. They might not be book smart, but how these guys are intelligent. They are street yeah. smart like nothing on earth. And I think those are the kind of people that I am. And in really case law enforcement's listening, I've never met one and I have no idea where any stills might I watched have it on been the telly, so might I'm be okay. in the future. You watched it on the telly. Um, but you know what, what I'm talking about? These people I grew are up there. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd met one in real life. I would have loved it. Um, hopefully one day. Uh, but, yeah, I just think. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. I was just. Sorry, I know I'm talking a lot today, but one of the things that you said actually reminded me of a story. And if 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 you'll give me five minutes, I'll t- I'll tell you. But you talked about the farmers going in the boardroom, mm. and one of the best presentation presentation sort of event things I've ever seen was I was this was back in the early maybe the late '90s, early 2000s when Sony was rolling out the PS2. That's how old this was. And the company that I worked for was a credit card payment company. And we were part of the the wider team. And Sony brought all the suppliers together into one room. And we all had, you know, five or 10 minutes to do a pitch on what our part of the project was. And so, you know, our MD got up and he had a few slides and he talked about how, you know, we're handling the credit card processing for sony so if anybody goes on the website and they want to buy kit and it goes through our thing and we do address verification and fraud check blah 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 blah. and everybody that got up had a you know very slick massively designed produced you know slide deck and everything the guy that did the shipping basically rucked up in what i would say is overalls you'd probably say coveralls here Uh, maybe and um didn't you know basically workwear, right? Like trucking workwear. He didn't have a suit on. He didn't have a tie on. He didn't have any of that. He rucked up and he basically got out on stage and he just looked at everybody and he said, I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to tell you what we're going to do. 
And then he proceeded in graphic detail to tell you every single step of the process, how the shipping worked, where the trucks were, how much they could hold. Like, I mean, he knew everything off the top of his head. Mm. And afterward, even I'm, I'm still talking about it yeah. today. This was 22, 23 years ago. And I'm, I still talk about that guy who got up and did that. And I know other people do. I met up with some people from that company the other day for drinks. And we mentioned, do you remember that guy who got it from Sony and blah, blah, blah? Like he made such an impression, but he's that kind of unsuspecting type mm. that would show up in the boardroom that people, if you just saw him on the street, a lot of people would judge him for the way he looked and the way he was dressed. And they'd be like, oh, he just, he's like some van driver. Yeah. But he showed up and absolutely blew everyone out of the water with the depth of knowledge, the detail, understanding, and everything, and he didn't need a slide deck to help him talk through it. And it made such a massive impression. And I I, yeah. I sometimes get a, a chip on my shoulder for people who live in rural areas because, and this is, I'll probably get hate for this, and actually I don't really care, <laughs> but I think a lot of people who live in urban areas, they're like the educated people. And they've all gone to university and they all have these white collar jobs and we all, you know, make lots of money and we sit behind a desk and we type on a computer a little bit all day. And then we make a hundred grand. I mean, I wish I made a hundred grand, but you know what I mean? We like make a hundred thousand pounds a year and then we go home and we don't do anything. Whereas, you know, we've got these people out who live in rural areas who are working their asses off, they're farming, they're doing all this stuff. And there's this kind of elite who live in the cities who think, well, these people didn't go to university, therefore they're stupid and they don't know anything. And if they were smart, they would have gone to university and they'd live in a city. And I, I that really annoys me. Yeah, me too. And so, you know, obviously I've, I've gone off on one a little no, bit, no, no. but, um, but no, no, I totally know what you're, I, I know what you mean. And when you said that, it just made me think of that story. So, you know, we can't, we can't write off people who, who live in other areas or who do different types of work yep. because we think that that work is somehow not, you know, you, you don't have to be smart to do it. It's just a completely different type of knowledge. And as you know, um, Jeremy Clarkson on Clarkson's farm is, has, is teaching people, you know, there's a lot more to it. And I think a lot of people who'd never had any sort of experience and would never watch a farm show if it wasn't Clarkson, frankly, and he's probably done more for rural people in a couple of seasons of his show than mm. anyone has ever done for rural people and actually going through and showing, you know, how much is actually involved and how much you have to know. And, yeah. you know, you it, it's a completely different knowledge set. Anyway, we've drifted completely off no, of no, talking no. about you, AI. You and haven't, that's totally though, fine. What I knew we were going to do that. So no, it's no, all right. No. But what I, what I think it brings it back to is... A, the, the fact that those that are the outliers are the ones that are pushing new boundaries, i.e. artists, creatives, what have you. Um, in the past, I know that there's been plenty of academics that poo-poo, you know, um, creatives. One of the things that I, I heard the other day, I don't have the background on this, so don't shoot me if this is untrue, but somebody was telling me that... Um, different loads of schools across the country and the curriculum they're reducing art and creative subjects quite frankly are you yeah 100 kidding me why yeah they're losing the budget for it and they can't they can't do it Ugh. yeah does me does my head it's terrible yeah crap. don't don't understand it but what that brings us to is that you know there will be those are the people that are more likely to be the ahead of the bell curve for want of a a different use uh, for use around things like like it's not it's unsurprising to me that the that there are that one of the biggest now correct me if I'm wrong on this but one of the biggest uses of AI appears to be enhancing people's creative output whether that be art whether that be writing whether that be um coming up with new ideas if they're a bit stuck you know hopefully in the future it will help things like um you know if a writer has writer's block and they just need a couple of ideas to then take on and what have you you know the combination of human and yeah. ai is always going to be you know minter dial who you i you know you and i met through you know he talks a lot about this about 
it's the the power is where the two things uh, you know art and sorry where ai and and uh technology and the human all come together and i agree but i do think it's interesting that the ones that are the non-conformists the ones that other entrepreneurial types are getting it more and understanding it and not afraid of it as much. That, yep. That's not that's not an right. incident. So who so can you share with us some names of people who you'd like to have on the show? Oh, do you have anyone yeah, in mind? I know that. you you have a couple of people you've teed up for the beginning. Yep. So can you share those? Are you willing to share those or do you want it to be a big secret and people I mean, the first will have to one check in and see who you've got? About. So that's um, Tom Morley. He has not signed anything, but we have verbally agreed that he will come on. Um, Tom Morley is one of my fine art uh, artists in the gallery. He happens to be an AI artist. Um, he's 70 years old, so it disbands immediately that, like, old oh, people don't get technology bullshit. He is creating – so he, yep. he he used to be the drummer of an 80s, very famous 80s band called Scritti Bilitti. Um And he he is using it to create the most amazing art. Um, he's he's prolific, which is cool. He's happy to go down different styles. He he has crafted the art of the prompt down to a fine art, so he's getting what's coming out. Uh, yep. And I'm really excited to be talking to him um, on this podcast. Yep. I think it's a perfect space for him. But he's also creating music. He's figured out how to do amazing looking watercolor yeah. style imagery as yep. well. And we've seen him. We've seen some of that of his we have. and we'll put his name. Actually, we'll go ahead and put his name in the show notes and everything for cool. today. And we'll drop a couple of links in so people can find him on LinkedIn or, or on his own page and, and stuff where he gallery. shares. And I think he good. has some social accounts as well. <laughs> exactly. And um, so people can go and check it out, but I'm really looking forward to that conversation because yeah. I think he'll be, he's exactly the type of person that I think, you know, we should be talking to. And so I think yeah. that'll be amazing. So and yeah, brilliant. The other per there's two more people I want to talk about. Um, again, I haven't spoken to this person, but I know you've you've interviewed Nicole Yershon before. So Nicole, if you're listening to this, I'm coming for you, yep. babe. I'd like to get to come back on and have a you and me chat, just you and me uh, on the show, um, because she is it very much about driving innovation into business. Isn't afraid of new ways of doing things, new technology, new thinking. Um, smart, smart woman, um, really driving where business needs to go in the future. She's a very future forward thinking person. Definitely want to have, have, be talking to her. Yeah. I want to bring on Minta again. I haven't talked to you about this, but I'd like to bring Minta on because he was in the world of commercial. He was um, senior senior global marketing um, person with a, in L'Oreal, so he understands the commercial side of creativity whether that be thinking strategy or 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 output, you know, imagery. Um, I definitely want to be talking to him because his view, uh, and he's done several white papers on uh, around technology, AI and, and, and so forth, um, and how it interacts with communication and people and, and empathy and all those kinds of things. So definitely want to be talking to him. Um, and the other person uh, that I definitely want to talk to, he again is unaware of this, but I will definitely be coming uh, to talk to him, is, is, a, is a chap called Tim Carter. He used to head up um, and work for Google and headed up the partnerships, um, Android partnerships program within uh, Google, very smart man. But like me, worked in the corporate world for many a long year uh, which I didn't even mention. That was what I was doing for for agencies. It was was new business. But he was he was um, like me, a maverick, much happier out on his own. Um, although I know he's working with, um, and this is one of the things I want to talk to, talk to him about, is that he's working with a, a video and film technology company that are using AI to speed up the process of. Uh, reshoots, re-edits, what have you. They're using AI. I think I've got that right in explaining it. Um, but I'll, I would really like to be talking to him about it. What's interesting is that even though he's done all that, he is actually originally tra uh, trained as a lawyer. So he's a really interesting guy that I'd like to get on as well. So, yeah, plenty of people. I'm only just starting my list because we only yeah, met yeah. yesterday to discuss that this was happening. Um, 
so yeah, uh, lots more to come. But yeah, pretty. Uh, it won't be. I won't be short of a person or two, and I'm definitely going to make sure they're interesting. Awesome. No, I can't. I can't wait. And yeah. when's your first? I think the first episode is the ninth. Well, this, no, this, this one's one. out. This one's going out on the ninth, and then it'll be two weeks after that. This one, one goes out on the ninth, and then Tom will be two two weeks after that. So yeah. what's that? The twenty something. I don't know. I haven't got it off the top of my head. Hang on. Third. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. I'm looking at my diary. One minute, um, please call it. Let's yeah. No, that's that's. We'll figure it out. And we'll we'll talk about it. Um. Again, and we'll put it. We'll put something in the show notes, and then you know, obviously, on any of the with any AI good. social accounts and things like that, it will it will come out, and and we'll talk about that. And the other thing that I'm going to probably, I don't know where I'll talk about it, but probably on socials and stuff is that we, the, the company, the media company, Future Hand Media, which is my media company, which sponsors the shows and all of that sort of stuff at the minute. Um, oh, that's a good point. We have a sponsor for your show as well. And, and I know you're. I think your gallery is sponsoring the show, which is excellent. So one that's going to be good. One of sponsors, one of many, hopefully. Yep. One of many. And I think the other, yeah, so the other thing is, is that we're signing up to have a membership to a very, very professional uh, studio. So we'll have access to some studio, very high quality studios in London, which would be really easy. It's near King's Cross, so transport people can get in from all over the world, actually within walking distance of our studio mm -hmm. that we'll have access to. So probably isn't going to be in the next few episodes, but hopefully as we progress over time, we'll start to have more face-to-face -face interviews in a in an actual real studio so we can start to move off of doing the remote recordings and we'll go much more in person. And I think that's really going to improve the quality of the show and that sort of thing. So we have that yeah. to look, you know, we all have that to look forward to the hosts and me and the guests and the audience and everybody. So I think that's going to be better for everybody and I can't wait I'm just signing signing the paperwork for that today, and yeah, it's really so good. You showed me I'm the super photos. excited about it. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm going to post some of that stuff on our social accounts, and everybody can see. And I'll I'll probably do a post or two about mm -hmm. it. I've got some little video clips. I'll try and I'm not very good at doing social content, but I'll try and make something <laughs> exciting. I'm excited. And, uh, it's gonna be good. Yeah, and no, I can't wait. And uh, well, thank you very much. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad we had this chat and I'm glad you got to introduce yourself a little bit more actually to everybody. And then next time everybody will be listening to you talking to Tom. I'm really excited. Um, I think the opportunity <laughs> is huge. Uh, I think where we can go with it is going to be pretty amazing. And I think we're hitting timing wise is pretty good for the world where it's at, where AI is at as well. I think if we'd done it too early, um, in the switch over, yeah, probably would have been too too early. But I think we're switching perfectly at the moment. So yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Lena. See you all on the next one. Exciting. Yeah, we'll speak to you soon. See you later. Bye. <laughs> I can't wait. It's gonna be fine. It is. It's, it's gonna, gonna be, be amazing. <laughs> okay, speak to you soon. Bye. Bye bye. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious. curious.